Okay, thank you all for coming out to this uh, event on patents and uh, potential patent reforms. Um, where this will be, we'll have two panels today. Uh, contrary to what the agenda says, um, I'm not Tom Leonard, I'm actually Scott Walston. Uh, we've swapped panels, uh, so don't be confused, don't be alarmed. Uh, and so this panel is on patent reforms, what needs changing or what doesn't need changing. I'll just give a very, very brief introduction for each of the panelists, and their more extended bio is, um, uh, you, sh you, should have, you should have their more extended bio. Um, so to my left, we have Tina uh, Chappell, who is the Director of Intellectual uh, Property Policy for Intel, where she develops and drives their policies for patents, copyrights, and trade secrets. She's worked on IP at Intel since 2005. Um, and also serves on the Advisory Council of the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Um, prior to her legal career, she was a software designer and programmer um, with IBM EduQuest, um, which I guess means you actually know things. Um, <laughs> uh, a few things. <laughs> um, Tyler, Tyler Grimm uh, is the legislative director to Congressman Darrell uh, Issa, who is the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee on Courts, uh, IP, and the Internet. And he handles the congressman's legislative portfolio uh, related to technology, patent, and uh, copyright issues. Then we have the Honorable Paul Michel, uh, and Judge Michel was appointed to the U.S. Court of Appeals in 1988 by President Ronald Reagan. 2004 became Chief Judge, and at the same time he was also appointed to the uh, Judicial Conference. In 2005, was appointed to serve on the conference's executive committee. In all, he's served 22 years on the court and judged thousands of appeals and wrote over 800 opinions, uh, about a third of which were in patent cases. And uh, at the end of the table, um, last but not least, we have Jamie Simpson, who is serving on detail to the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, for Senator Chris Coons, where she works on IP policy. Uh, formerly, she was senior advisor to the Undersecretary of Commerce for IP and director of the USPTO. Uh, so let's start with um, uh, Judge Michelle. Um, let's start with a sort of broad question, uh, how you, uh, what you think about the um, American Vents Act uh, and IPRs, and what you see kind of as it's uh, as the, the it's it's the implications it's had and its key uh, problems. Thank you. Um, in essence, in the last three to four years, uh, the patent world has been turned upside down. Uh, when the act was passed in 2011 and became effective in 2012 and in part in 2013. We couldn't predict the practical effects because uh, it was too soon to tell and there were too much uncertainty. But now we have full experience with uh, IPRs and the other two review procedures uh, uh, created by the Act, and so now we know. If we think about the innovation ecosystem, the invention generating system, and we consider that the dashboard of its health uh, is in front of us. Every single indicator is now a blinking red light warning of impending disaster. Patent values are down 60% by some economists reckoning based on public records. Investment in R&D is down 40%. Uh, U.S. venture capital that used to be kept almost entirely in this country and invested in invention and R&D and commercialization and product development and the like is now increasingly fleeing overseas. It used to be 84% uh, stayed here. Now it's down to 53%. Uh, in the venture capital community, uh, money is fleeing R&D and technology and going into entertainment. Uh, as well as going abroad, so what stays here is no longer so concentrated in uh, R&D. Uh, all companies that depend on patents are hurt by these uh, dynamic economic forces. Uh, smaller businesses uh, and universities tend to be hurt the worst, and those who suffer absolutely the most are startups. Ironically, startups historically have been the source of most economic growth most productivity growth, most job creation, uh, and most big breakthrough technology. So startups are the most valuable of all players uh, based on that historical uh, perspective. Uh, startup creation in the last couple of years has dropped to a 40-year low. 
Every year now, and in the, for the last couple of years, more startups have died than were born. That's the first time that's ever happened in the entire history of this country. So not surprisingly, in the Chamber of Commerce annual rating of global patent systems of their strength and their efficacy, we were always number one, and suddenly we dropped to number 10, tied with Hungary. I, I don't mean to disparage Hungary, but Hungary has hardly been a leader in technology or patents. Uh, former Soviet Republic that uh, is struggling, and yet uh, we now tie with them for the efficiency of the patent system. So uh, the question is, uh, can we make adjustments based on facts that are now clear with the experience we've had, particularly in the last uh, several years, so that we can uh, uh, adjust the patent system, both uh, the review system under uh, particularly IPRs and the enforcement system in the courts in a way to have a system that's fair, that's functional, that's balanced, that's reliable. Right now, patents are viewed as unreliable, as weak, as not very useful, and therefore they can't incentivize the investment needed to surge ahead with technological leadership uh, globally, which we've always enjoyed. And of course, technological leadership means globally competitive. When you lose that edge, we're not going to compete based on cheap labor costs. That's the opposite of the situation. So ironically, we're shrinking eligibility and making patents unreliable at the very same time that Europe and much of Asia, including China, are broadening eligibility and making enforcement much stronger, with injunctions being routine, for example, in Europe and now even in China, with uh, trials being fast and cheap, unlike here, uh, and with remedies being increasingly strong there as they get increasingly weak here. So the uh, future prospects are of job losses, of economic decline, uh, of standard of living going down, of technological leadership shrinking, and so forth. So I see uh, the patent system as in a crisis and in need of immediate uh, rebalancing. Uh, it can pretty much only be done with respect to eligibility uh, and court enforcement by the Congress. With respect to uh, rebalancing the IPR process, it could be done this afternoon by the director of the patent office uh, under existing legislative authority, including from the AIA itself. So. The IPRs are a solvable problem. Uh, the solutions are clear. Some of them will be explored later this afternoon in a hearing in the House that begins uh, just around about the time our session here ends. So uh, my uh, uh, involvement uh, is to try to provide uh, objective advice to the Congress, where I've testified recently, uh, because I have no affiliation with any company, any industry, any technology, any organization. I don't own any stock. So if, uh, I'm in a position to be about as objective as any fallible human can be. Uh, and I'm hoping uh, that there'll be uh, increasing willingness on the part of policymakers in the White House, in the Patent Office, in the Commerce Department, uh, and, in, and in the Congress and its staff uh, to assess the recently uh, revealed facts and to make the necessary adjustments so that uh, the country can move ahead. And I'm very discouraged by, the, uh, and this is my final point, uh, by the continuation of a highly emotionalized, uh, propagandistic debate uh, talking about patent trolls and abusive litigation and outrageous behavior by this or that uh, anecdote, which as far as I can tell is entirely unquantified and not supported by hard facts or good statistics and flies in the face of the economic disaster that we're courting by continually enfeebling uh, the patent system. So I applaud the organization sponsoring this event for bringing together people from dis different disciplines, not only uh, at this table, but at all the tables in the room, because uh, smart, patriotic people can solve all these problems if they work together sensibly. Thank you. Um, let me just ask, uh, you, you touched on this uh, a little bit when you talked about venture capital, that you said it was affecting uh, to paraphrase, that it was affecting sort of the direction of investment, um, that venture capital is going to other things. And um, is this also true with, uh, with how it's affecting what uh, companies and, and individuals want to patent? Because the number of patents keeps increasing pretty steadily. 
Uh, and even in China, um, I mean, the number of patents in China is going way up, but that trend started well before um, the AIA was passed. So is it, is it really a question of um, uh, uh, that, 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 that the law is kind of diverting research into other, other areas, um, and it's affecting certain parts of the economy more than others? Well, I think you have to remember that uh, the majority of patent applications in the United States are not any longer filed by American companies. They're filed by foreign companies. So the total number of patents isn't a very good measure uh, of anything in terms of the health of the American innovation engine. Uh, and uh, the second point to be made is that not only is venture capital fleeing R&D and fleeing America, so are all of the other sources of capital. So whether it's a private equity fund, a pension fund, a commercial bank, or any other funder, uh, they're, they're also fleeing uh, the innovation system because of the very same enfeebled uh, patent regime that we've imposed on ourselves. Uh, and uh, if you look at the money managers within American corporations, they're also fleeing R&D for the most part for the very same reason. There's no longer an adequate assurance of a return on investment. Uh, the time to money is now greatly elongated, upwards of a decade. The risk of invalidation is uh, exceptionally high. Uh, the inf uh, enforcement remedies are extremely weak with injunctions practically non-existent now, even though they're routine in other countries. So uh, people say, well, the, the point of the patent system is to encourage inventors to be creative. I don't agree with that. As long as people are employed, whether they're engineers or other technologists, they'll be creative because that's their nature. That's what they like to do. That's what they're good at. The real point of the patent system is to incentivize the needed investment, whether it's internal corporate money or external money from venture capitalists or the others. And that's what's collapsing along with the uh, strength of patents. So uh, everywhere I look, I see uh, signs of uh, extreme distress uh, and uh, some uh, venture capitalists are now predicting that the next chapter will be that uh, American market will be flooded with foreign products that are violating valid U.S. patents, but the enforcement is so slow and so weak that American company won't be able to protect themselves against these foreign knockoffs expected soon to start flooding our market. So. Uh, it's hard to see uh, anything that's encouraging other than the willingness of leaders in Congress and elsewhere to take a second look at where we are on patent reform and to consider whether we didn't overcorrect. There were real problems. There are uh, frivolous lawsuits. Uh, I don't think that uh, they're uh, endemic and they're certainly not the majority of cases, but it, it was a problem. It's still a problem, less so now. Fee shifting has tripled in incidents, which is an encouraging sign to discourage bad uh, actors. Uh, but there's still some abuse. But the question is, is the main problem uh, frivolous lawsuits? Uh, if so, you would expect the finding of frivolity by the courts to be rather high. It's actually under 1%. So when people talk about frivolous lawsuits, I say, well, yeah, there's some, but very few. So then what's the real problem? The real problem is we can't incentivize the investment anymore because we've so weakened the whole system, it's irrational for people who control money to invest in R&D and commercialization. It's as simple as that. Uh, Tina. Sure. <coughs> Good afternoon. Uh, first, let me start by uh, thanking Judge Michelle because Judge Michelle was on the bench when I, as a young lawyer, went to the Federal Circuit. And so I hold him and all the judges of the Federal Circuit in great esteem. And, uh, and Judge Michelle and I enjoy doing these things together, although we sometimes have a different viewpoint. So he's not going to be surprised that I have a little bit of a different viewpoint today. Um, and my viewpoint uh, sort of gets formed because of the fact that I actually work at Intel Corporation. We hold about 90,000 patent assets worldwide, and we invest over $13 billion each year in R&D. So when I talk about R&D and patenting and innovation, it is truly at the core of my heart and of my company's heart. And in fact, there is a quote by one of our co-founders that sits at our headquarters that says, innovation is everything. I truly believe that. And like Judge Michelle, 
I care about American innovation. I believe my company cares about American innovation and American competitiveness. That said, I see a different trend. I mentioned earlier that we spend $13 billion each year in R&D. Four of the top five U.S. spenders of R&D are technology companies. That's true in the U.S., that's true globally. So the majority of R&D money, over $40 billion in R&D last year, were spent by tech companies. That's just in the top four. In fact, if you take a look at the top 25 U.S. spenders of R&D, they have increased year over year from 2011 to this year. And in fact, they've increased 40% from 2012 through 2017. 40%. Now we're spending about $180 billion in R&D with the top 25 U.S. investors in R&D. We also have the Kauffman Index of Startup Activity that shows that starting from about 2012, which the relevant date of 2012, I'm sure all of you know, is the date after the America Invent Acts became law. So we're going to start with that year. It's a lot of the data points that I'll share with you because that's the year the law really became effective and it's changed. From 2012 through 2016, the Kauffman Startup Index showed that startup activity in the U.S. doubled, more than doubled, 194% increase from 2012 to 2016. And I don't think that's going to be surprising to a lot of you because if you think about what you've seen, you've seen these things come out, you've seen drones, you see smart cars, you see artificial intelligence, deep learning, neural networks, cybersecurity, blockchain. There are a lot of innovations coming out now. Robotics, drones, did I already mention that one? There is a lot of exciting things coming out, a lot of them from the tech world. And I think it's an incredibly optimistic and wonderful time to be involved in innovation and to be involved in IP in this country. And in fact, I think it's a great opportunity for us to take a look at the new kind of innovation that is coming out and to say, does this continue to serve our economic needs? Because we all agree that patent systems and IP systems really exist only to serve one goal, and that is to benefit the economy of the countries that they exist, and thereby its people. And I think we have great examples of that happening today. Um, the U.S. Chamber report that I think Judge Michelle mentioned showed a drop in one of the areas of IP issues from 1 to 10, but overall the United States still ranks as number one in that list. And if you take a look at the Global Innovation Index, the U.S. has gone up since 2012 to 2016. We were at number 10, we're now at number four, and we've been that number for the last two years. So I, you know, in my perspective, coming from the tech industry, coming from an industry that's, that actually innovation is not only still there, it's thriving. And what we used to do in a year we're now doing literally in months or weeks. This is an exciting time for innovation. I see great promise for that. And I don't think that a lot of the things that you may see in the future that are going to happen, I mean, I'm a patent lawyer. I have a reg number. I did prosecution. I did litigation as a patent lawyer. We love to think that what we do drives businesses to make the right decisions and drives our economies. And in some part, it does. But also having sat at a business now, Unfortunately, it's not as much as we think it is, right? There are other things that drive business decisions about where to build factories, including tax laws, including immigration laws, including foreign direct investment. There are a lot of things that inform a company's decision to make products, where to make those products, and who to make those products with. It's not all the IP. And so I do think that it's worth having this conversation about innovation and American competitiveness, but I think we have to truly look at the facts with a very objective mindset and sometimes maybe get a little beyond our normal patent self where we want to say that it's all due to us when I, I think it's probably really not. So it sounds like, I mean, that, I'm not sure that was really a defense of the America Invents Act, but rather an argument that it may not have made much of a difference. Is that, is that what you're saying or am I reading no, too much into this? I, I, I should be uh, careful not to create that impression. No, I do think the America Invents Act had a, a positive change. Number one, it did make us consistent with other countries in first to file. And number two, we're a fan of IPRs, right? It takes roughly, well, you can look at even old AIPLA reports that say five to $10 million to try a patent litigation from start to finish. And when it takes five or $10 million to prove that you're right, 
in a patent dispute, that's not a good system. But let me give you an example. We have a, an NPE that has sued us over the last 12 years five or six times. They've lost five or six times. Every time they come against us, they lose. Do you want to know how much money we spent on that? I can't tell you. <laughs> Trust me, that money was diverted from other things that the company could have done. And even though Intel survived six different repeat from the same troll, that would have closed the doors on a smaller company. We can weather it because we have the funds to weather it. Our SMEs can't weather that kind of repeat action. So we do have to have a system where you can get rid of bad patents that really never should have issued and have that be faster and more cost effective. That's what IPRs did. So I think probably one of the greatest benefits of the AI is actually the IPR system. That's not to say that change can't happen in that system and that change has happened in that system. In fact, if you look back when IPRs were first instituted, the institution rate was extremely high. And then if you look at every year since then, that institution rate has dropped. And now if you do it based on a calendar year, that institution rate is barely above 50%. So change has happened in that system to make it the right system, as you would expect a system to happen, because no system comes out day one perfect. But it is a good system, and it is a better system at being able to get rid of those patents that really shouldn't have ever issued. I mean, frankly, we get panels of three legally, technically trained judges. They are highly qualified to make this decision. So if we care about patent quality, then I trust them just as much or more than I trust a single examiner or a jury that isn't legally or technically trained. So are you, is Intel spending less um, either settling or defending uh, from NPEs under AIA than it was previously? Let me answer a slightly different question mm -hmm. so that my finance people don't get upset about me talking about budget. We have less litigation filed against us by NPEs, yes. And in fact, I think you can see that across most of the tech industry that um, NPE litigation has dropped a bit. Um, Which means we're not spending money on the lawyers as much as we are on other things. Right, so uh, WIPO says that the median settlement for NPEs is um, higher now than it was sort of in the few years before. Is that, um, is that true, but there, there are just fewer um, cases? I'd have to understand their data points for that. Yeah, to, to, that's to know fair, if they were fair enough. Where they're um, getting that, uh, Jamie. I know you've been concerned about um, unintended consequences of <laughs> AI. Uh, a AI. Uh, sorry, yes. not AI. AIA. I'm doing work on artificial <laughs> intelligence too. We're getting all confused here. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, so thank you. Um, and, and first, I should just say I'm here speaking in my personal capacity. But yes, um, unintended consequences. I think I'm um, picking up on some points that uh, that Tina has brought up. You know, I, I think I hear from a range of different people who've had different experiences with the interparties reviews at the PTO and have a lot of concerns. And I think five years now that we've kind of seen how they work and seen how they operate is a really good time to step back and really ask if these concerns that were, some of them voiced pretty early on, still present, um, you know, whether that they're really worth addressing. And I, I think there are many reasons to think that they are. Um, and, you know, one of that goes to, um, Tina mentioned the institution rate. Um, if you look at the institution rate on a per patent basis instead of on a per petition basis, it, it's more about 70%. So I think someone who's you know, invested in a patent over time and they're a business person and they learn that this asset that they thought was fairly secure, if it's taken to this um, proceeding and you know, there may not be a lawyer so they may not understand all the nuances of it, why would they ever invest in something that's going to be taken away from them as soon as it, they actually think it might be worth something, as soon as they have a product that it might be backing? And I think that has driven a lot of the trends that um, Judge Michelle talked about. And those are certainly a lot of the concerns that really have made the senator I work for concerned about the state of American innovation and the patent system. Um, you know, and, and while it may make sense to have the PTO take a second look at patents, I do think there are a lot of things to look at at the IPRs, the interparties reviews, and say, are, are these really balanced? So for example, the uh, America Invents Act, um, one of the promises it, I think it made with the interparties reviews was to make 
um, litigation more efficient by having this alternate forum. In some cases, you end up having not just your district court litigation, but multiple I IPRs or IPRs that someone files a petition that didn't quite work out. They file another petition to, um, to correct that or you know, certain gamesmanship that can occur where your district court case already has a verdict, but then someone else can challenge your patent in an IPR and blow up the whole thing. And I, I think for all of these reasons, it's worth taking another look at how IPRs are created and trying to actually make them deliver on that promise of efficiency. Um, if you choose to bring certain challenges in the IPRs, you should not be able to bring them in the district courts. Um, I think that was the original intent of the EIA. It's the way some of the courts have interpreted it. I don't think that's the way it's actually working out in practice. So that, that's one example of, of many things I think are, are worth taking a second look at now. Um, another example I, I will add to that mix is aligning the standards from district court and the IPR proceedings. I think there are a lot of efficiencies to be gained by having the two have the same um, standards. There's actual potential for one forum to look at the work of the other and, and be able to use it. And uh, more than that, I think the standards that the district court uses appropriately reflect, reflect the fact that a patent owner or inventor had to convince the PTO to give them a patent in the first place. They should get some benefit from that, and that's what the district court standards do. You know, Jamie's right about if you take a look at per patent, the percentage goes up. I think it's, depending on if you do fiscal year versus you do calendar year, I think it goes to 60-something percent versus 70. But the reality is that trend has still gone down. I think there's one other data point that's worth us talking about, too, because um, as Jamie mentioned, some people see it as an alternative to litigation. That's not how I see it. I see it as an issue of patent quality. If these patents should never have issued, then the PTO should have a second chance to determine it. None of us are perfect, um, and so none of us always get it right the first time, every time. But the thing is, when I do something wrong, it doesn't equate to a government grant of a right to exclude. So therefore, we need the patent office to have an ability, a meaningful ability, to take a second look at their own work, which was done by one examiner. The other thing that on this data point that's relevant to talk about is the percentage of cases that actually have a district court case and then have a subsequent IPR filed, and that percentage is about 13 percent. So we're talking a fairly small percentage of overall district court cases that actually have an IPR filed in them. You know, the, another consideration should be, in my opinion, to compare court results with IPR results. It's fine to have a less expensive and faster adjudication of patent validity. Uh, but the question is whether it not only guts invalid patents, but also destroys valid patents. If you compare the results of re-exams with the results at the IPR, they're the opposite. Re-exam uh, by elite core of examiners, the survival rate is over 60%. If you look at IPRs, the kill rate is over 60%. If you look at the court system, same thing. 60% of the patents challenged in court uh, survive, but 60% die in the IPR. So uh, yes, we should have the IPR system. Uh, it is faster, uh, generally speaking. It is much cheaper. Uh, and if you assume uh, an invalid patent, it's a, a great way to solve that problem and invalidate the patent and take it out of play. But if it's invalidating valid patents because the procedures are so tilted against the patent owner, which many believe is the case and which I believe is now the case, uh, it seems to me impossible to justify standards being different in the IPR process compared to the court process. After all, the question of validity of an issued patent is a legal question. So when it's resolved in the courts, that should be authoritative and it shouldn't be subject to being, in effect, overruled by an inferior administrative tribunal in the patent office when the Article Three courts have uh, found a patent to be uh, uh, valid. So uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, the question isn't whether the IPRs are uh, useful and attractive, the question is whether they're fairly balanced and are reliable and accurate, and comparing 
IPR results to re-exam results or court results, it looks like they're killing a lot of good patents as well as bad patents. So that suggests to me the need to readjust. And uh, I think Jamie is exactly right. It's impossible to justify having different standards in IPRs versus the courts. So the Supreme Court says uh, in court, uh, a patent has to be shown to be invalid by clear and convincing evidence. In contrast, the IPR says, oh no, mere preponderance of the evidence is good enough. How can you justify that disparity? So uh, uh, down the line, you, you know, in court, if you have dueling experts, uh, the adjudicators, the judge and the jury, uh, get to hear the uh, uh, dueling experts live and see them cross-examined. In the IPR, there's almost never any chance to cross-examine the other side's expert witness. No live testimony. Even though it's technically permitted, it's virtually never done. So that's another disparity. In court, you get discovery if the other side has uh, evidence that bears on obviousness, which often is the case. Uh, for example, evidence of deliberate copying. Uh, but in IPRs, there's virtually never any discovery. And not only is there a, a sense that the process in IPRs is wrongly tilted against the patent owner, it's, uh, uh, it's been uh, clearly abused by short-selling stock people, uh, by uh, repeat uh, uh, filing of IPRs in uh, case after case after case. Uh, and you know, uh, the Patent Office, in my opinion, did not follow the intent of Congress in the way it implemented uh, the IPR uh, process. The, the, the intent of Congress was for uh, clearly suspect patents to be put through the IPR process, but not any patent, not every patent. Uh, so the Congress delegated to the director a policy decision, not a technical decision, a policy decision about which cases should be put into IPR. But the director uh, chose instead to pass on that power to the patent board. So now we have the patent board um, trio of uh, administrative judges deciding whether to institute a case and whether to uphold the patent or not when the intent of Congress was clearly for that to be a policy decision by the director and uh, line subordinates of the director that does not include uh, the patent board. Uh, and obviously the Congress didn't intend sh stock short sellers to be able to uh, game the IPR system in order to make money on, in the stock market. So there are lots of ways in which the implementation of uh, the good intentions of AIA have backfired and worked out uh, perversely, which to me is all the more evidence that appropriate adjustments are needed and they're needed right now before we have more harm inflicted. Jamie. So I just wanted to pick up on a point that Judge Michelle ended with because um, I, I've heard this from, from many patent holders about how um, the PTAB was designed with the director delegating um, the responsibility for the institution decision to um, panel of three PTAB judges. And I should start by saying I'm friends with many PTAB judges. I think they did, or I think they do a very good job, but I do think the way that the PTAB is structured um, presents itself as being biased to the patent owners, and, and this is why. So a, an IPR has two different phases, the institution phase and the trial phase, and the trial phase has slightly more, I would say, sort of due process protections. It has exchange of expert testimony, for example, an opportunity to present uh, depositions that you've done outside of the proceedings, um, and, and those in the institution decision don't exist even though you can submit expert testimony, you don't get to depose them, for example. Um, but from a patent owner's perspective, they have the same panel at both stages, and at the first stage, at the institution stage, that panel has already decided that so the claims in the patent are more likely than not invalid. So even though you get procedural protections in the subsequent trial and maybe some new things are discovered, the perception is you already have you know, three judges who have spent a lot of time with the case and kind of are bought into it. 
And I, I don't think that's the way the AIA intended it to work. The, the actual language of the statute says the director is supposed to make that decision. I think a lot of people ex expected that the director wouldn't literally sit there and decide every case, but would probably delegate it to a different part of the agency. Um, and there are a lot of different ways you could do it. That's not the only one. But I do think just the way they're structured, there are a lot of reasons to think there needs to be some change in decision makers to actually make that trial phase feel that it's fair and just to the people who are going through it and potentially losing, you know, valuable property right. Just um, one data point, because I guess today is my day of data points. Um, we talk, and there's a lot of conversation that's had about multiple petitions. And so looking at the multiple petition study that USPTO did itself on its own procedures, 87% of patents challenged in IPRs have only one or two petitions in their life, 87 percent. Um, so I want to come it's, uh, soon to talking about legislation, and, and Tyler can tell us exactly what's going to happen in the hearing and exactly what they're going to decide and what the ultimate answer is going to be from oh, Congress. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but, but before we get there, some of this, though, you know, uh, it especially what, with what Judge Michelle said. Um, comes down to sort of just the inherent um, debates that we've always had about patents, which is how broad they should be, how long they should last, um, how, how much they should cover. Uh, and um, so, you know, part of the question is where do you want, you know, where do you feel it's better, you know, the, where, where do you feel it's, you're, you're better off more likely making an error in um, invalidating a patent that should exist uh, or keeping a patent that shouldn't exist? Right, because the, the, under the AIA, you're more likely to invalidate a panel, a, a patent that maybe should not exist, right? Um, and under the, the courts, it's harder to invalidate a patent, right? So, which way do, which way should we lean? Because this is about, this is sort of about ideology is the wrong word, but it's you know inherently what you think about patents and how strict they should be. I, I, I'm not sure that's right, Scott. Uh, it seems like you should have a system at both the patent office and in the courts that's accurate, that's rigorous, that's logical, uh, and that's predictable. Uh, so it seems to me accuracy should be the goal. Uh, and if you're getting inaccurate results in the IPRs, which I think is happening uh, with an appreciable percentage of the cases, uh, there should be adjustments. And in terms of what happens in court, uh, it's very facile for people to say, oh, well, juries are lay people and they're not really trained in technology and they, they, they can't understand obviousness law and so forth. Uh, but that's a little disingenuous because every obviousness decision is double-checked on post-trial motions by an Article III district judge. They are trained in law. They become very adept at the technology before them. So it's not just lay juries, it's juries and judges in the courthouse that uh, assess uh, the validity of challenge patents. Uh, so uh, it seems to me uh, the question uh, is, do we uh, trust the justice system or not? And it seems to me uh, the country has made the choice since its founding that the ultimate arbiter of legal issues are the courts not administrative agencies. So to me, it's anomalous and really kind of infuriating that a final judgment by the Federal Circuit after a trial and post-trial motions and an appeal upholding the validity of the patent can, can and has been overruled by the patent uh, trial and appeal board subsequently. That seems completely anomalous and crazy to me. That's the lower tribunal overruling the higher tribunal. That makes no sense, and it means that title to the patent is never settled, never quiet title, as the legal phrase puts it. If you, if you don't have quiet title to your patent, it's a piece of paper. It's not going to generate investment incentives which is, as I keep trying to stress, the, the heart of the matter. So I'm not against IPRs. I'm in favor of IPRs, and I've testified to that effect. Uh, the question isn't whether to have IPRs. The question is whether to adjust them in light of experience to make them fairer, to make them more accurate, and thereby to make a patent law and patent results more predictable and more reliable. That's in everybody's 
uh, interest. Every industry, every kind of company, large or small, in every technology. And we don't have that now, and that's what we need as a country. Did you want to say something before we get to uh, Oh, Tyler. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, I completely agree with Judge Michelle that the system needs to be rigorous, accurate, predictable, all of those things. And, and also on the point about sort of this notion of putting people into camps on these issues, you know, you were, people describe themselves as being pro-IP, which necessarily means there's a group of people that are anti-IP. Um, you know, I work for a guy that has 37 patents that spent the majority of his life in the private sector. Um, he and Judge Michelle had a wonderful exchange, I think, at our last hearing, uh, which I'd encourage you to go um, uh, check out. It was just a, everything you'd expect from a congressional hearing uh, or what it should be in terms of just a, a thoughtful, productive exchange. Um, you know, so, uh, and we're working this through, and, I, and behind the scenes, Judge Michelle sent us some information. We are hearing from a variety of stakeholders as we work through um, these issues. You know, it's, it's not, you know, putting people into camps, I'm not sure, helps all the time, you know. That'd be like saying we're anti-art just because we don't want to hang everything in the museum. Um, and, you know, bigger picture, I think you were going to ask just what's going on in Congress. It's, it's a fascinating time right now, right? Um, last year, if we were having this discussion, I would have told you that our top priority was venue reform um, and that patent reform in Congress would look something like a venue bill with a few other measures on top of it. Um, and there was a venue provision in the Innovation Act that was my boss's amendment to the Innovation Act, and we would sort of hoped that that would move um, as a standalone measure, and TCR Atlanta changed all of that. Um, and uh, there's obviously been litigation based on TC Heartland, which we think has been productive. And um, so we're waiting for that all to work out. We don't see a need eminently to legislate there. Uh, at the same time, I mean, we've been talking about IPR for the past 10 to 15 minutes or so. And um, we have a hearing about the IPR process as it relates to sovereign immunity this afternoon. Um, but those conversations could be irrelevant in a couple months if the Supreme Court decides in the oil states case um, to invalidate IPR. Um, and then, you know, we in Congress have to pick up the pieces there. And so that's all just to say it is a fascinating time. It is a chaotic time. Um, um, a lot of balls in the air. Um, maybe that's a good time to talk about oil states, at least for those who uh, feel comfortable talking about it. Um, why did the, why did the court agree to hear this case? Do they want? Are they trying to make? Do they want to make a statement? What what are they doing? Obviously, none of us really know. <laughs> uh, they don't ever explain why they deny cert or grant cert. But my hunch is they granted it because they kept being asked time after time after time, and because IPRs. Uh, uh, and the other AIA reviews became controversial and became elevated in the public discussion and in debates in the press. So the Supreme Court, uh, by my guess, said, well, we better step in and settle this one way or the other. My uh, prediction is that they will not dismantle the IPR system. They might make some marginal changes around the edge, say that it was constitutionally permissible as enacted, and for the most part it was constitutionally permissible as uh, applied, as implemented, but in this little specific or, or that, uh, it's maybe questionable, and that might impel the Patent Office to make some of the changes that I think they should make in their procedure. I'm entirely in favor of the 273 judges. I think they're very conscientious, very smart, well-trained. Um, uh, but uh, the procedures are the issue, not the quality of the judges or their honesty or intellectual uh, diligence. Uh, and among the procedures that seem to be way out of whack and out of uh, line with the clear intent of Congress is the question of amendment. When you read the act, it seemed to me very clear that Congress expected 
amendments to be freely made uh, in pending IPR cases. But in practice, as it's actually played out, they're virtually never allowed. So this is another example of where the procedures are tilted against the patent owner and in a way inconsistent with the evident intent of Congress. As I said, those procedures could be changed tomorrow by the PTO director or by the Congress, either way. Uh, and maybe when um, Andre Iancu uh, finally gets confirmed and becomes the director at the patent office, maybe he will institute some of the reforms that many of us uh, think are called for. And if he does, the job of Congress will get easier because they won't need to intervene. If you flip it around the other way and the new director, like the former directors, does not make uh, reforms and changes, uh, then Congress will have to act because uh, there's no other way. And the other 500-pound uh, gorilla in the room is eligibility, where the Supreme Court has created massive, massive uncertainty and unpredictability and created standards that are highly subjective, uh, unadministrable, uh, by the 10,000 actors who have to implement them. You've got 1,000 district judges, 8,000 and some patent examiners, uh, uh, various uh, uh, federal circuit judges and uh, PTAB judges and so on. So you've got about 10,000 people that have to implement eligibility law. They can't possibly do it consistently. They can't possibly do it predictably. The Supreme Court, at least as it's been understood by the district courts and the federal circuit, has put the country in a trap. Uh, 101 on its face, the eligibility section of the Patent Act, I think is rather clear, and it doesn't provide for any exceptions. Well, the Supreme Court came along and made up some exceptions as if it were a common law regime rather than a statutory regime, and it's time for Congress to take back the power that's rightfully its uh, as the representative body. Supreme Court justices are not elected by the people, don't have the wherewithal to make national innovation policy. The Congress has the ability and the procedures and the duty to do so. Uh, so whatever we do with respect to IPRs, in my opinion, it's equally important that we uh, end the total chaos in the eligibility arena, and, and that can only be done by the Congress uh, uh, clarifying what it meant in the, the very short language of Section 101, which they plainly have uh, complete authority to do. The, the uh, implied exceptions, as the Supreme Court likes to call them, uh, 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 are not constitutionally based. They're, they're based on Justice Breyer's guess in Mayo that uh, patents might impede more invention than they promote. Guess based on what? You know, no record, no expertise, no uh, exploration of the issue in the Supreme Court when they issued the Mayo opinion that is then put on steroids uh, uh, in, in uh, Alice and applied to all technologies. So IPRs are a big problem, and an equally big problem is eligibility, and therefore even if IPRs get fixed by patent office leadership, the Congress must act on the other issue, the other huge problem, eligibility, because the patent office and the federal circuit can't do it. They're not allowed to do it. They're, they're subordinate tribunals. They must follow what the Supreme Court seems to have mandated, and they do, uh, except, you know, a little interpretation right on the margin that doesn't affect very many cases. So uh, Congress is going to have a big role on eligibility, even if they don't end up having to be the one to fix the mess of IPRs. Tyler, is, um, it, is uh, oil states affecting your timeline or thoughts on where legislation might might go, or are you just not paying attention to it? The timeline sort of <laughs> presumes that we're that there looking is a at timeline. changing, <laughs> yes, uh, changing IPR. Um, no, I, I think it's just something taking up some oxygen in the room. Uh, you, you know, it's, it's there, it's in the background, it's something people are cognizant of. Um, I mean, this afternoon we're having a hearing on uh, issues of sovereign immunity, which if you've taken time out of your day to come to a panel on patents, I assume that you've um, read about the case of a certain pharmaceutical company transferring uh, six of their patents to an Indian tribe for the purposes of avoiding IPR under the guise of sovereign immunity. Um, this, I think, got a lot more attention than the company probably expected um, and has certainly riled up people on Capitol Hill. Um, Everybody just sees this as uh, largely um, a misstep, 
um, hopefully an abuse of, of how the system should work. If you read um, the district court's opinion and their note on the use of sovereign immunity here, they say something along the lines of, you know, this is a sacred right that we've given to Native American tribes, and um, here you are thinking it's something that you can just buy. Um, it's also raised questions about um, uh, sort of drug prices that I think will, will come up at the hearing today. Um, but, you know, I, I think to judge Michelle's points, though, um, some in industry are using this as a moment and saying the situation with IPR has reached a fever point. It's gotten so bad that look at this particular situation. People are going to desperate lengths to avoid um, this process. Um, so I'd like, let me interrupt you for yeah. just a second. And uh, So I'm probably unfairly putting words in your mouth, so tell me I'm... I, I'm wrong, but so are you saying that um, oil states is basically irrelevant, and this particular incident with sovereignty has a much bigger effect, is potentially more more important? Uh, no, I think they're separate legal, quite completely separate oh, you you said, legal questions. Oh, sorry. Oh. Yeah, I think they're separate legal questions. Um, I mean, you know, the question in in oil states is really a Seventh Amendment and Eleventh Amendment type question. Right, and the sovereign immunity question, sovereign immunity for, for, for Native American tribes isn't something that's in the Constitution. It's sort of a construct that the Supreme Court has sort of given them since the 70s, I guess, is when they sort of recognized this right. And um, um, that's the issue here. It just has implications for IPR. I mean, it's a very blatant you know, we've, we've transferred our patents to the tribe, and um, now we get out of your process. Um, we should take, you know, oh, sorry, go ahead. You know, let's, I'm sure everyone's aware of the allergen case where they transferred their patent to the St. Regis Mohawk tribe. You're probably also aware that that same tribe now owns patents that have been asserted against tech companies. Um, if we simply c allow... Um, this kind of procedure to be an inroad around the patent office having an opportunity to take that second look, then what's going to suffer is going to be patent quality mm -hmm. because we're not going to allow the patent office to have an ability to truly look at those patents and decide whether it was correct. And, you know, you this, semantics to some extent but not really, you never have a patent that is quote-unquote deemed valid, right? You have a patent that is deemed not invalid, mm -hmm. There is always the opportunity to bring new prior art, uh, prior art that an examiner did not know about. So that patent is always subject to that. And the reason that is important is because we care about patents. I, I think, you know, Tyler's point that it's not good to cast people as either pro or anti-IP, I think that's a very good point because the reality is we should all be pro-IP. But even more than being pro-IP, we should be pro-innovation. And if we care about innovation, then we have to stop thinking only in the confines of one realm, which is patents. We have to think about patents. We have to think about other issues that impact a business world in order to make innovation. We're in a global economy today. Whether we want to believe it or not, our competition is no longer just the people next door to us. China, for example, has made it a national strategic objective to supplant semiconductors by state-owned entities. So if you want to talk about innovation and you want to talk about competitiveness, we have to have a bigger conversation about this. We're doing wonderful things in the U.S. right now. In fact, our GDP is the highest level it's ever been last year. It grew 9 percent from 2012 to 2016. But we have a very competitive environment coming up. And when you talk about artificial intelligence and deep learning and neural networks, the dynamics change. The dynamics of these products change. And in fact, I foresee the time that you have this convergence of what has traditionally been the tech world and the pharma world. Because pharmaceutical drug discovery in the old realm where they did it with pen and paper, writing down what drug you took, when you took it, what symptoms you felt, is so low tech. Today we're putting wearable devices on them in partnership with pharmaceutical entities and research companies that are sending 300 data points a second to an artificial intelligence system. We're changing the way you even do drug research. 
But that is going to change everything about our products and our processes in the future. Let's um, take some questions. I'm going to ask. Yeah, right there. I'll wait for the mic, which is right there. Thanks. Um, I'd like to come back to uh, Judge Michelle's point about uh, subject matter eligibility and ask him, first of all, if there is a formulation for legislation that you support and that has widespread support, and then ask the two congressional panelists whether Congress has any appetite to address that issue. Well, as um, many are aware, uh, at least three organizations have proposed legislative fixes, the intellectual property owners, the American Intellectual Property Law Association, and the American Bar Association Intellectual Property Section. All three of those uh, legislative proposals uh, have some merit, in my opinion. On the other hand, I think they're unduly complicated and lengthy. Uh, if I were writing a 101 fix, it would be about one sentence long. It would be fairly simple and clear, and it would basically convey the idea, uh, the twin ideas that uh, if something is purely a mental process, it can't be uh, patented regardless of obviousness or the other conditions of patentability. Uh, but beyond that, there shall be no implied exceptions by the courts, period, full stop. Well, in, in terms of interest, I guess I would just say from my experience when I've tried to approach other people who do not handle patents on a daily basis and talk about inter parties review, um, their eyes tend to glaze over a little bit. Um, but when I approach them and say, um, because of a few recent Supreme Court cases, we've um, scaled back uh, what patents we're giving in two of the most innovative areas of our economy, um, software patents and medical diagnostics, and patents on those same technologies are being extended in China and Europe, it gets a lot of attention um, because that is a pretty big concern. Um, I, I think you know, trying to address it in an appropriate way, as, as soon as you start looking at the proposals, you, you start to go back down a rabbit hole, even though I think you could you'd do it with a single sentence too. Um, but I, I think there is an appreciation that this is an area that, that needs to be looked at and could have some pretty significant competitive um, implications if it's not addressed. Obviously, an issue people have been talking about since the Alice decision. Um, as Judge Michelle noted, there have been a number of outside groups that have released uh, what they think 101 should look like. I agree with the overcomplicated um, aspect of your feelings about um, their proposals. Um, I would note that there has not, to my knowledge, been any legislation introduced in the House or the Senate um, based on those proposals or others. So I think to answer your question simply, I doesn't seem like there's much interest. And I think when I approach people about 101, a reaction I get largely is, you know, we're not super inclined to hastily rewrite something Thomas Jefferson wrote. Right. Um, so, yeah, I think unlikely to see it this Congress. You know, appetite uh, in Congress, and I spent nine years there as a staffer at the Senate in a prior life, uh, is to a great extent uh, a function of what the corporate world wants and what the media is saying. I agree there isn't a big appetite uh, evident in Congress now, either in the House or the Senate, to fix the 101 disaster created by the Supreme Court. Uh, but that will change uh, if and when a significant portion of the corporate community starts telling the Congress that it has to change, and if and when the media catches on to the severe competitive disadvantage uh, we've uh, um, put ourselves at vis-a-vis -vis the global competition that Tina Chappell correctly uh, emphasized. Uh, it, it, it doesn't take an economic genius to see where the money is going to flow when things like diagnostics are eligible in Europe and not eligible in America. 
and when a huge portion of the software related inventions are eligible in Europe and Asia and China and even, uh, and not any longer eligible in America because first the money is going to uh, outflow and it already is, and then second the talent is going to start uh, outflowing, and then third the litigation is going to start outflowing, and when those trends become unmistakably uh, huge and dramatic and worrisome, Congress will suddenly develop a very big appetite. Um, uh, oh, yes, you know, I do think that, um, as my co-panelists have said, that there, you know. I can't speak for the bio world. I can't speak for the pharma world because it's not a world that I come from. I can speak on the software side. Um, Intel is a hardware company, but as our CEO said just this year, we're actually a data company. Um, we're one of the largest software creators in the United States. It's not a fact understood, but hardware doesn't do anything without software and firmware. So we're actually one of the largest software companies. And in our experience, um, on the whole has been that we have not had insurmountable problems with 101 in seeking our own prosecution. Um, and that we think it's important, particularly in software and the dynamics of software and the fact that software is inherently somewhat non-physical, that we have very rigorous processes to make sure that the right software is protected and that a lot of this other stuff is not. So in our experience from the software perspective, it has not been uh, troubling. Let me just mention one of the data points I don't think I responded to earlier, which is the, the U.S. venture capital funding. Um, it's actually increased 86 percent since 2012 to 2016. It went from 32.8 billion to 61 billion. Yeah, but the it's percentage to casinos, not R&D and technology. I don't think that would be actually correct, but let me let me speak to one other point though. The the number going down that Judge Michelle referenced is actually the U.S. share of global start of global venture capitaling. That is not necessarily tied to a change in patent reform, but to a change in the fact that other countries have begun to recognize the need for this, including China, and that they are starting to spend a lot in this. So. Proportionally wise, number wise, our share has gone up at the same time other people in the world's shares has gone up. So therefore you can see our global share go down, but from net dollars we've increased from 32 billion to 61 billion since 2012. Um, we can take one more question. Um, then I want to ask one more question that nobody might have an answer to, but it's completely different. Um, I'm wondering uh, about if there are any implications of uh, the changes uh, on how patents are treated in the tax bill. Um, that uh, in the tax bill, they'll change the way, uh, it, the new changes that self-created copyrights, uh, uh, ch changing, uh, sorry, not copyrights, changing, uh, changing hands of self-created patents will no longer be subject to capital gains tax, but will subject to ordinary income tax, right? Um, does that have any implications for how uh, Congress might be thinking about patents as property? <laughs> I know um, it's a bill. Uh, yes, I'll know. speak on, on behalf of all of Congress. <laughs> um, <Please. laughs> no, you would do just as well. Yeah, uh, we. Um, um, it's a good question. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they're in the middle of a markup uh, this yeah. week. The situation's very fluid. Um, it's not. It's not something. That I don't. Maybe Tina, from just a practitioner standpoint. I mean, how you view the provision. Well, I could say I'm not a tax lawyer. I'm a patent lawyer. Um, my understanding is my tax lawyer really likes it yeah. and says it's a good thing, um, that it will be useful to us. Uh, Intel is not like some of the other companies out there. All of our IP is actually owned in our U.S. entity. We have never owned our IP or sent licensing funds through a foreign entity. So they're all owned by Intel Corp. 100. You know, Scott, if uh, IPR... Uh, needed to be maintained exactly as is because uh, of the bad patents and the frivolous lawsuits and the irresponsible demand letters, uh, the logic would suggest that Intel and other big tech companies would be suffering severely on a financial basis uh, because of all these bad patents and frivolous lawsuits and bad de uh, demand letters. But in fact, Every one of the big tech companies is making historically unknown profits, and as Tina points out, investing in 
huge amounts of acquisition of smaller uh, technology developing companies and doing their own R&D. So there's no basis to suggest that big tech is being bled white by bad patents. Sure, it's an irritant. Sure, it's a cost. Yes, there are some abuses, but they're not causing severe harm uh, to big tech. They are causing severe harm in the human health sector, which has the greatest potential for huge advances that we've ever experienced. The, the uh, medical sciences are on the verge of enormous breakthroughs against cancer, Alzheimer's, every horrible disease you've ever heard of, but they're now starved for money because of the unreliability of patents in substantial part, and we have to change that. But they may not be able to own their patents when the cure for cancer is invented by an artificial intelligence. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, uh, just real quickly, uh, you know, a lot of the back and forth between Tina and Judge Michelle has been about sort of all alternative causalities for a lot of these different statistics and where numbers are going. You know, and Judge Michelle referenced startups earlier, um, and we think about startups a, a ton in the context of, of patent reform. I mean, in one sort of hidden element here is that we can talk about the number of IPRs filed, et cetera, but the number of demand letters that are sent to um, startups is n not something that's reported, and I think that's uh, something that does take a, a tremendous toll on that community. Um, so we could go on all day, and I guess Tyler actually <laughs> will. Um, but uh, we have to move on to the next panel. So thank you all very much. I, uh, I really enjoyed this, and thank you all for participating. Thank you, Sam. <laughs>
uh, served as a chief counsel to the Senate Antitrust Committee. Uh, Tad Lipsky is currently an adjunct professor at the uh, Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. Uh, he's had a long and uh, distinguished career in, uh, in uh, antitrust, uh, uh, economics, and policy. Uh, in the early 1980s, he was a deputy assistant attorney general under, uh, under, William, under Bill Baxter. Um, uh, more recently, he was the co-chair of the transition team for the FTC uh, for the Trump administration. Uh, and he served as, uh, as acting director of the FTC's Bureau of uh, Competition. He's been the chief antitrust lawyer for the uh, Coca-Cola Company and a, a partner at uh, Latham and & Watkins. And last but not least is Urshka Petrovic. Sorry, my, apo my apologies. <laughs> um, who is a senior consultant uh, with Criterion Economics, uh, where she focuses on patent issues and antitrust law. And she has pub she's published a book and several articles analyzing the enfor enforcement of SEPs. And she was recently named as the European Commission's non-governmental advisor for the, uh, uh, for, for the International Competition Network. Um, I've asked each of the panelists to start off with uh, with uh, brief opening statements of five minutes or so, uh, broadly uh, addressing the following questions. Um, what is the appropriate role of antitrust in the standard setting process? Have the competition agencies, both domestic and foreign, uh, pursued the correct approaches? And uh, what course changes, if any, should the new appointees at DOJ and FTC pursue? Obviously, we're not going to finish with it, we'll, we'll, we will continue with that after the five minute uh, presentations. But um, if we could start with Carolyn. Thank you. Sure, thank, uh, thank you very much, Tom, and thanks for having me here today. I'm very honored and humbled to be on such a distinguished panel. Um, so I guess I will start off with what I believe the appropriate role is for um, antitrust enforcement, the DOJ and the FTC. And so I think of it sort of a, um, as both process and substance. So. Process-wise, I think you know. So I think ideally, the role will be limited if everything works out the way um, the way it should or could. Um, one way to preempt any need for enforcement is through the DOJ and FTC engaging in competition advocacy and business guidance, and they've done a fair bit of it on this uh, in this respect regarding standard setting over the course of many years. Um, when evidence points to market power, and then when evidence points to market power conveyed to SSOs being abused or harming the competitive process and consumers, and it's entirely appropriate for them to use their law enforcement authority. So first, just a little bit on competition advocacy. I did that a lot in my role at DOJ. Um, and this, this is a very important role to play because it helps provide some transparency to businesses. It helps educate other government entities. Um, and they can do that through a number of ways, through speeches, reports, um, business review letters, in the case of FTC, advisory opinions, and both DOJ and FTC have been very active on that front um, over the years. Um, they have, uh, I think we've seen a common thread throughout them, and that has been acknowledging the competition <coughs> concerns that arise in the context of standard setting. Standard setting is almost always, there's always a concern that, that um, you know, there's always a there's always you know, a potential concern for um, anti-competitive conduct if it would be in the terms of price fixing or something like that. But generally, we see that standard setting is, an, is a very pro-competitive and good thing for consumers. And we're willing to take um, the market power that it creates through a standard because of the benefits that um, helps improve all of our lives in the ways, ways that we communicate um, and in a number of other ways. Um, but we've seen this common thread throughout um, beginning in 2006 and 2000, well, not beginning, but going back as far as 10 years in 2006 and 2007 when then Assistant Attorney General Tom Barnett wrote two business review letters about SS, SSO policies. Um, we've seen that continue um, in the following administration, DOJ and FTC, um, have both provided guidance through closing statements. DOJ most recently in a Samsung investigation about conduct, and then in Section 7 um, investigations regarding a series of patent transactions. 
Both statements noted the concerns. Both statements um, acknowledged that there are that uh, that an issue existed as to whether as to what remedy um, SSO or SEP patent holders could take. And um, DOJ closed the investigations after commitments were made not to seek injunction or exclusionary orders. Um, DOJ and PTO had a joint statement that provided further guidance about this issue in 2013, um, and they weighed in on whether or not injunctive relief or an exclusion order were appropriate remedies when a patent case came up in, involving standard essential patents. Um, in 2015, the DOJ issued a business review letter to the IEEE, a standard setting organization about its policy to prohibit injunctions and exclusion orders. Um, when patents are franned or rand encumbered. Um, in that case, it said it had no intention of enforcing against a policy where IEEE would, um, would prohibit that. So all these, uh, there were a number of speaking engagements and speeches, and I think all this um, transparency about what the officials at DOJ are thinking is very useful, I think, to the community, and also useful to thinking about um, where, uh, where competition um, enforcement authorities need to be looking for new problems, and I think that's part of the evolution of, of antitrust enforcement. Um, on substance, I largely believe that the DOJ and FTC have gotten things right. They have struck the right balance in recognizing the significant importance of patent rights, as well as, and, and the pro-competitive benefits of standard setting, while taking heed of the potential risk to competition that are inherent in the standard setting process and that convey such significant market power. Um, the positions, as you know, have not advocated for a blanket prohibition on injunctions, and that's where the big um, source of controversy, or one of the big sources of controversy has been. Um, but it's reasonable to limit the use of such a blunt force in procedural instrument um, of an injunction or an exclusion order. Um, and so generally I think this acknowledgement of patent holdup is, is um, something that the enforcement agencies have and should continue to look at. Um, but hopefully, again, sort of going back to um, the role that competition advocacy can play and the role that the DOJ can play in providing business guidance to the standard setting organizations, hopefully that role will be limited because um, there can be some proactive uh, efforts taken on behalf of standard setting organizations to um, ensure that the way that we want the system to work, to have these brand commitments be meaningful and then create standards that everyone can um, implement and uh, and practice and um, bring bring benefits to consumers can continue without any potential holdup, which can have the effect of increasing royalty rates, increasing price to consumers, and um, harming the uh, the the uh, process of adoption of standards and then ultimately innovation. Thanks. Uh, so our high pr our high royalty rates. Uh, are they, uh, under what circumstances would a high royalty rate be an antitrust uh, violation or so, so I'm looking from, per, from perspective of, you're creating a situation where you're creating such undue market power. Um, and I think if you look at the FTC's Qualcomm case, they, um, they raised some serious concerns about what they call attacks, I think what the court called it something else. Um, their ability to increase prices on those who are who need to use those patents, and that's being a harm. I mean, I don't think anyone at the agencies, but these two will correct me if I'm wrong, want to get involved in you know price regulation. But when you look at the incentives that are set up by um, by standard setting organizations and SEPs, um, you do create an incentive and ability of those who get the enormous benefit of having their technology included in a standard. Um, you have the ability of them, you give them inherent in that a lot of market power. Dad. I was afraid you'd call on me next, but, uh, <laughs> uh, and for the most part, I think I could give a statement uh, very similar to yours, and it would be uh, very difficult to detect the differences, so I'm going to try to home in on exactly what they would be. Uh, it is, I think there is a consensus that innovation is exceedingly important. I think there's a consensus among economists that uh, at least half of the in, in improvement in world uh, living standards over the last couple centuries has been attributed to innovation, and therefore there's really no argument with the kind of views that uh, Judge uh, Michelle was stating in the first panel that it's exceedingly important 
uh, not to fiddle with or endanger or undermine the patent system, which is one of our key systems for providing incentives for investment uh, and innovation. So I, I think there's a lot to agree on, uh, agree on there. Uh, the standard setting process, of course, uh, has a very useful and important role. Uh, there, were, there, there was a dark age in U.S. antitrust law when almost all forms of competitor collaboration were attacked very aggressively under antitrust laws, including the use of per se uh, analysis for what we would now regard as legitimate joint ventures. Uh, Congress was not asleep when that occurred, and beginning in the 1980s when they passed the uh, uh, National, National Cooperative Research Act, they started actually a series of detroubling provisions where the most severe antitrust remedies and litigation tactics could not be used against legitimate competitor collaborations. It started with R&D, it extended to manufacturing, and uh, ultimately it was reflected in the, uh, I, I may get the title wrong, the Standards Development Organization Promotion Act of 2004. Uh, what's, uh, SDOA, excellent. So I think that's kind of a universal recognition in scholarship and agency statements and policy analysis by the economists uh, that standard development organizations uh, play a very important role. Uh, they should not be treated either as per se exempt from antitrust law or as per se illegal. And it's, uh, it requires a very uh, uh, refined and discriminating uh, and objective analysis in order to, ter to determine whether there are any aspects of standard setting, uh, the standard setting process that can lead to um, anti-competitive results, and and uh, and they uh, and they can, uh, you know, anytime you have an extensive competitor collaboration, there is an uh, there is an opportunity for uh, going overboard in terms of coordinating competitive conduct or exchanging competitively sensitive information. It's all a question of making sure you analyze uh, with sufficient care the right uh, uh, facts and circumstances, uh, the aspects of industry performance that can lead you to discriminate between uh, situations that are on anti-competitive on balance and those that are pro-competitive on balance or no worse than competitively harmless. Now, have the, competi have the competition agencies uh, pursued the correct approaches? Uh, we might uh, ha have a few differences here. Um, uh, two instances that were mentioned are, are examples uh, that, uh, that I think I would tend to, to uh, disagree with. Or let me say I would have some differences with. Uh, this is the, uh, the joint statement 2013 that was mentioned between DOJ and PTO taking a particularly well-described and presumptive line on the, uh, on, on the competitive risks of the assertion in an injunction action of a fr what we call a friend encumbered SEP, uh, you know, uh, uh, standard essential patent uh, that is subject to a prior commitment between the patent owner and the standard development organization involved, that the uh, that the intellectual property, the patent uh, incorporated in the standard, would be licensed on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms. Um, I would have disagreed with the use of any special rule in that context, um, and I, I, th I think I caught you in a slight psychological uh, uh, bind here, <laughs> because I, I think I heard you refer to a blunt force injunction, but we must never forget that in intellectual property law, because it is intellectual property, uh, the the uh, the ability to get an injunction, uh, it's what you get, it's all you get, and it's the only thing you get that will help fulfill the purpose of the intellectual property law, which is to allow you to extract whatever monopoly power, whatever monopoly profits you legitimately can from your innovative activity. Now, it doesn't mean you're entitled to every monopoly profit. Uh, uh, you know, across the landscape, it doesn't allow you to acquire the patent that constitutes the leading competitive technology. It doesn't allow you to acquire uh, the uh, your all of your horizontal competitors in corporate transactions. But it does allow you to extract all the monopoly power 
and the monopoly profits available from that which you invent. The, uh, the one way it's been put is that everything under the Marshallian demand curve for that which you have invented, you're entitled to under the patent law, and it's very important that we uh, that we preserve that. So when you use, an in, use the, the legal system to get an injunction for that purpose, uh, it makes me nervous to refer to it in, with any kind of, in any kind of pejorative sense. As I say, this is what you get, this is all you get, and that is what we need to make sure that the reward to innovation is properly distributed the way our legal system uh, has sorted it out since 1790. So uh, the other intervention that I would like to raise a uh, slight question about is the 2015 IEEE uh, Business Review Letter. Uh, there's a vast literature which should be accessible to anybody who, who has access to the internet and a search engine on the, uh, the, special, <laughs> the special characteristics um, of that particular Business Review Letter which seemed to go a little bit out beyond the breakwater of simply stating an enforcement intention, which actually described policies uh, adopted by the IEEE and more generically standard development organizations. Uh, it kind of gave a roadmap to how to structure your friend and, and intellectual property right policies uh, in a way that the Department of Justice would regard as acceptable. I think it was... Uh, a stretch. Uh, I believe that these questions, incidentally, are very effectively addressed in the article by Maureen Olhausen at, in the Stanford. Is it in the Technology Review? Yes. Technology okay. So, Review. so those of you are interested in the, you know, in 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 uh, in, in an argument built up in more than 35 seconds uh, should uh, should take a look at that that article. Well, all right. So, what course changes of any? Uh, should the new appointees at DOJ and FTC pursue. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, my personal observation is that uh, the, the, the market and the private ordering of relationships between intellectual property owners and other stakeholders in the standard development organization world should be allowed to work themselves out without excessive intervention from the antitrust agencies. So um, I'm going to, uh, you know, the, the, uh, and, and uh, probably the most important thing is that the foreign antitrust agencies are following our bad example uh, with a vengeance. And I have said in other contexts, and there is a report by the, uh, uh, what's called the International Competition Policy Experts Group, which was issued in March of this year, recommending that the administration take a look at uh, foreign agency antitrust principles and antitrust procedures that depart from sound principles of due process and sound substantive principles incorporating uh, rationally based and empirically based economic analysis and figure out how to roll back uh, some of these in inappropriate uh, uh, foreign antitrust uh, enforcement uh, efforts. That's about all I have time. For, but I, I just wanted to summarize my advice uh, with uh, the, um, an acquaintance of mine who happens to be a, uh, a, a state judge where I, where I usually vacation has a boat, uh, which I, th I love the way that this judge has named his boat. He's named his boat the Remain Silent. <laughs> so Remain Silent, I think, might be... Uh, if, we, if we can't persuade the other agencies to follow economically rational uh, and, and uh, objective and impartial and efficient procedures, uh, let's remain silent. So uh, I, 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 I've, I found the Earl has an article very good, too, and it generated probably most of the questions that I'm going to ask <laughs> on this panel. But so do you, I mean, would you agree with her assertion pretty much? that uh, the FTC has essentially adopted a no injunction, and maybe the Justice Department as well, essentially a no injunction rule for, uh, for uh, uh, Frand encumbered. Uh, well, uh, th the way I would put it is that it, it, it's, it, because the injunction plays such a central and essential role when the patent mechanisms are working as they're intended to work, I think it's a terrible mistake to say anything that sort of brings into question that the assertion, uh, that, that the good faith assertion of a right to an injunction 
could create an antitrust risk. And I, I think that's a great danger, and uh, th that's what I'd say. That would be my response. Erska. Uh, thank you, Tom, and thank you to the Technology Policy Institute for having me here. So given the time from the European Union, maybe I can focus a little bit of, n on what happened in the European Union, so the role the EU competition law and antitrust enforcement had in the European Union. Uh, a lot of the principles and the basic idea that we have discussed right now have been confirmed by the European Commission as the, EU, uh, as the EU antitrust authority. So standard setting is good, a lot of pro-competitive pro benefits arise from this, but there are also some anti-competitive concerns. And if you look at the last decade or even more, we can see that the European Commission was extremely active in the context of standard essential patents both uh, while looking, when looking at the work of standard setting organization, but also in scrutinizing the behavior of SEP holders. I think already in 2005, the commission ended the investigation that it brought against ETSI, the European Telecommunication Standardization Organization. At the time, the concern was patent ambush, so the patent holder failure to disclose during the standardization process that it has patents that are or might become essential for the discussed standard. And the European Commission was concerned that ETSI disclosure rules were not strict enough or imposing uh, clear provisions to avoid the risk of patent ambush. And so it decided to bring this investigation against Etsy, um, questioning whether Etsy behavior could be considered anti-competitive. But the commission ended the investigation after Etsy decided or announced that it will revise its, its disclosure policy. Then only two years later, the European Commission went after a SEP holder, Rambus. And in that case, the commission was also concerned with patent ambush, but said that patent ambush combined with the subsequent patent holders in position of excessive royalties can constitute an abuse of a dominant position in violation of Article 102. The Commission ended this investigation after Rambus entered into a commitment decision with the Commission, which is the equivalent of a consent order, and agreed to impose a cap on the royalties that it was demanding for its standard essential patents. Then, a few years later, the Commission focused again on standard setting organization. It issued um, a the, the document was called Guidelines for the Application of Article 101 to, to Horizontal Cooperation Agreements, and there was a specific section focusing on standardization agreements. So basically the idea was, the Commission said, we know that standardization agreements have pro-competitive effects, but there is also the risk of anti-competitive effects. So um, to avoid this anti-competitive effect, standard setting organizations should adopt specific procedural requirement that uh, will ensure transparency, openness of the process, and the commission recommended specific procedural requirement that standard setting organizations should adopt to mitigate the risk of any anti-competitive effects. Those requirements were mainly related to the disclosure of the patents that could be essential, friend commitments, and the requirement that the friend commitments travels with the standard essential patent. So if the SEP holder transfers its, its patents, the friend commitment is binding only for the, also for the new owner of standard essential patents. Um, then, a few years later, in 2014, the Commission uh, focused more on uh, SEP holders. Probably you remember it started two investigations ag against SEP holders that have used injunctions. Uh, one was Motorola and the other was Samsung. And in that occasion, the Commission said that uh, if a SEP holder has committed to uh, license its standard essential patents on friend terms, it cannot request an injunction against a so-called willing licensee, that is a licensee that is willing to enter into a license agreement on front terms. Now the question is how does a licensee show that it's willing? The commission said that, that's, that the licensee can do so by agreeing that a court or an arbitration body will determine a friend rate. Um, as you probably know, in 2015, the European Court of Justice issued a decision which rejected the European Commission willing licensee approach and said it's true, the subholder's request for an injunction 
can be anti-competitive in some cases, but it will typically, the request for an injunction will typically not trigger antitrust concern if the SEP holder has notified the infringer about the standard essential patents and has extended the front offer. Um, it's probably a little bit out of the context, but we know that there were subsequent development uh, at the national level, and SEP holders were able to obtain injunctions after the uh, European Court of Justice decision in Huawei. So long story short, the European Commission was extremely active in the context of standard setting and in addressing the subholders behavior. Now to your question, Tom, whether their approach was good or not, I believe that um, commentators can present different arguments. Some people, or probably the commission, would say, well, we have identified certain problems in the standard, standard setting context and in the context of using standard essential patents. We have used our soft law mechanism to address these problems. Some of our suggested solutions were accepted by the market, others were rejected either by the market or by the court, but we have stimulated this discussion and we have now clarified a little bit the, um, the setting in which the parties can negotiate. And the commission would probably also say we, although we initiated several investigations, we have imposed no fine, even in Motorola where there was an infringement decision, the commission said that the issue was too novel and therefore decided to not impose um, a fine on Motorola for the infringement of Article 102. Then critics of the European Commission would say, well, uh, the Commission overstepped its role. Uh, its role is to enforce antitrust law, it's not to make the market perfect. So it should really focus only on, on the type of conduct that violate antitrust law. And critics would probably also say that the European Commission intervention was not that innocuous because it uh, distorted the market, it distorted the negotiation for standard essential patents. Probably some infringers felt more entitled to use standard essential patents and delay the negotiation for a year or more without fearing that the court might impose a remedy. But also as had mentioned, the European Commission intervention had some effects outside the European Union. So it was followed by, or it could have inspired the action of competition authorities abroad that were less reluctant to impose fines on those that allegedly violated antitrust law. Thank you. Andrew? Well, let me begin by, of course, thanking Tom. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to be on this distinguished panel and see Caroline and Ted and Niederska. Uh, I will say I uh, wouldn't be a very good number two at the Justice Department if I got out ahead of my boss. He's giving a speech in Los Angeles on Friday on IP issues, so I will uh, try to address Tom's questions and answer others, but I might invoke the right to remain silent uh, if I have to. Um, Look, I mean, I think that everybody in the room agrees that innovation is one of the primary drivers of economic growth, and that's uh, why IP rights are critical to the modern economy. And so when we talk about competition law and competition policy, the stakes really are quite high. And um, it's long been the, the view of the antitrust division, and I think this is true between administrations, that the intellectual property laws need to provide important incentives both for innovation and for commercialization, because both of those processes ultimately benefit consumers. Uh, relatedly, the division has long viewed uh, patent licensing as generally pro-competitive, and that's really a critical point. It's where we start our analysis, and it is where we urge uh, fellow competition agencies around the world to start their analysis when they're looking at IP-related activities. Um, Obviously, much of the dialogue lately has focused on the specific issues regarding standard-setting organizations, and I will share some views about the proper application of antitrust law in that particular context. Uh, it's been noted many times that the importance of interoperability standards has increased exponentially over the last several decades, especially in the telecom sector, and the number of patents being declared essential to standards really has exploded. Uh, 
of course, by, by allowing products designed by different firms to work together, the setting of standards has made those products more valuable. It's uh, fueled the creation of new and innovative technologies and created real tangible benefits to consumers. Um, at the same time, uh, as the economy is increasingly characterized by information technology and IP assets, the setting of industry standards has arguably become even more and more critical to the way we live and the way we behave every day, and, uh, and it's also become more complicated. Uh, the legal framework can have tremendous impacts on the incentive to innovate. And that's why in the context of uh, standard setting, we believe that antitrust enforcers and courts should be cautious in applying antitrust law where other remedies might be adequate to uh, police the commitments of intellectual property holders. Um, so we think that the first and best line of defense against the abuse of standard setting is the standard setting organization itself and the policies that it imposes on its participants. Uh, we know that these policies often include licensing requirements and disclosure requirements, and those may vary in their specificity between standard setting organizations. If, uh, if a patent holder violates a commitment that it voluntarily made uh, during standard setting activities, that action could impact competition in some way. But that doesn't mean that antitrust law provides the appropriate remedy in every instance in policing this type of behavior. There are, for example, uh, statutory and common law remedies that can be available to help, um, uh, available to implementers of uh, technology that can help them uh, address those issues without resorting to antitrust law. For example, uh, one of them is breach of contract under the common law. In the U.S., if, uh, if uh, a patent holder violates a voluntary commitment that it made to a standard setting organization, a breach of contract action may be available. In that situation, a party can litigate the facts regarding what constitutes uh, a breach of the relevant commitments, and then a fact finder can decide it. Similarly, fraud. If one or more participants in a standard setting organization commit fraud through non-disclosure or deception in standard setting, and we've seen many cases that have involved this, then there are statutory and common law fraud remedies that are available. And of course, if there's a RAND commitment and the licensee and licensor are having trouble agreeing on a rate, there are sophisticated judiciaries and arbitrators that can help uh, adjudicate the dispute, uh, applying what has become fairly robust case law in this area about how to think about uh, RAND commitments and how they fit into the analysis. So under the existing uh, statutory or legal framework, uh, it's really not the duty or role of the antitrust division or antitrust law, for that matter, to uh, police and decide whether patent holders are living up to their commitments or to engage in price regulation and regulate patent royalties. In fact, we believe that refraining from applying antitrust penalties in this context actually gives teeth to the remedies that are available under contract, contract law or patent law, uh, fraud law, and uh, that antitrust enforcers should be careful not to usurp those other mechanisms. So at the end of the day, it's really the patent holders who need to make decisions about how to exploit their property rights and do so knowing that the consequence of their actions may subject them to litigation in the areas I've, I've identified. Uh, the application of antitrust law laying over the top of those uh, common law principles uh, threatens to punish IP holders with additional onerous penalties uh, that can deter innovation and discourage the development of the next great technological leap. I should be very clear, though, we're not calling for weak enforcement or no enforcement where a violation of antitrust law actually exists and there's no other adequate remedy. Uh, but we do think that standard setting organizations deserve scrutiny to ensure that their activities are not anti-competitive, for example, by adopting rules or taking other steps, including the application of those rules that may promote or facilitate anti-competitive conduct by members. And I'm sure you're all aware of cases like Radiant Burners and Allied Tube and Hydro Level, where the Supreme Court 
condemned efforts by standard setting organizations or similar types of associations that were used as a means to exclude competitors or products. And those decisions identified the potential harm to competition that can follow from that conduct. Uh, so I think I'll just conclude by saying when we have reason to believe that standard setting is facilitating or masking anti-competitive conduct, uh, such as by enabling SSO members to manipulate rules for the purpose of excluding competitors, uh, we won't hesitate to use those rules uh, and what's available at our disposal in fulfillment of our, our law enforcement mission. Thanks. Um, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the international uh, dimensions of all this, and I'd, I'd like to actually cl maybe cl clear up in my mind kind of a a factual question. Um, my impression, I think, maybe I didn't, wasn't listening carefully enough from something that Judge Michelle said was that that uh, Europe and we were going in we're, we're going in different directions with respect to injunctions. Um, and I don't know if that applied to you know in the in the in the in the SEP case or that was he was thinking of other things. Um, I think Tad, you said something like. Uh, Europe, 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 and we are are going in the same direction, which is not it's a little unclear to me who's leading who. But um, uh, and that was not uh, the the right direction. So, are we diverging or converging? Or um the main the, the main point I wanted to make is that uh, uh, in 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 recent years, particularly as this. Uh, uh, you know, blizzard of complaints about uh, standard essential patents, uh, particularly in the mobile phone, you know, smartphone technology is kind of rolled out. Uh, we've, uh, we've gone a little far, we've been a little careless. Uh, I have, you know, previously, you know, mentioned that sometimes, uh, sometimes the words used are, you know, kind of seem innocuous, but if you, compare them carefully to prior statements, uh, they actually open up a, a, a bit of a, a can of worms. Uh, my, my favorite illustration is to contrast the basic uh, policy statement that Bill Baxter made when he was uh, confirmed as Assistant Attorney General. He, he said, in, in uh, the way I enforce antitrust, if it doesn't make economic sense, it doesn't happen. In other words, this is a clear commitment that every enforcement action taken by the by the antitrust division uh, would be consistent with with well thought through uh, economic uh, empirically backed economic analysis. Uh, when President Obama's first assistant attorney general came into office, she immediately number one revoked a very extensive Department of Justice statement on unilateral conduct. And, and in that context, she made, she made the, the, uh, the statement that she thought that there would be a, a rebalancing of law and economics in antitrust enforcement in the Obama administration. Now, what did that mean? In comparison to a statement that economics would be essentially the, the ruling, the, you know, the governing concept, a statement about rebalancing could only suggest that there would be law enforcement under circumstances where the economics did not line up. Now, I think that the, um, uh, you know, the, the actual practical consequences of those kinds of departures were thankfully <laughs> uh, minimal. But in this area, I, I, I'm afraid that, the, uh, that, that there was a certain amount of damage done, that when the, for example, when the Federal Trade Commission went out with in the in the uh, uh, Rambus case and went went out in other cases with the so-called freestanding unfair methods of competition theories, in other words, the the theories used to challenge conduct under Section Five of the Federal Trade Commission Act that would not have been supportable under the antitrust laws, the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act. Uh, it immediately provided justifications for foreign jurisdictions to, to, to uh, brush aside any criticism of the enforcement actions they were taking, and particularly in this IP area, uh, uh, that, that departed from sound economically-based antitrust analysis. They would say, well, there's an element of an unfairness in our law, 
and it's in your law too. And uh, look at the Rambus case where you where you use that. Look at the Intel case where you use that. And that is so the the, the foreign jurisdictions uh, are very adept at using our own words against us when our and particularly when our words are careless to try to uh, uh, smooth over or or get additional enforcement running room. Uh, in circumstances where enforcement action would not be justified under a clearly articulated and applied uh, economics-based uh, uh, standard of, of what constitutes anti-competitive conduct. So, so that's the danger. Um, Andrew, the, um, uh, the leadership uh, uh, in the antitrust division seems to be um, making a priority of, uh, of international uh, Issues and presumably that's a maybe well they're important but presumably maybe a particular interest of uh, the assistant attorney general since that was part of his portfolio and the his previous uh, stint in the antitrust division. Um, so what do you see as what do you see as the as the opportunities there and what do you think? What, what would you be hoping to accomplish? And so I think there there are two things and you're right. So when Macon was previously at the at the antitrust division, I worked very closely with him, and he was the international and policy and appellate deputy, and he focused a lot on the intersection of uh, IP and antitrust, and especially in the international context. And uh, if you look at his uh, Senate testimony, his confirmation hearing, he he said that he would make that a focus again in in uh, uh, the current administration, and that's that's what he's going to be talking about. On, on Friday, I think there are really to preview only a tiny bit. There are two features of that that are that I would emphasize now, and one of them is a uh, continuing desire to bring clarity to how uh, antitrust law in the U.S. applies uh, to standard-setting organizations and applies more broadly uh, to IP rights in the U.S. and hope that carries over and that we can take that message abroad through our international advocacy efforts. I'd actually uh, sort of echo something that Ted just said by quoting Maureen. Uh, he said it in more words. She said it a little bit more eloquently, perhaps, not a criticism. But she said uh, in a recent speech, uh, she observed that emerging economies uh, view developments in the US, including enforcement and advocacy by US agencies, often through prisms of their own history and economic pressure, citing them as justifications to disregard or diminish legal protections for US proprietary technologies in their own countries. And so that we're going to, to try to promote a greater understanding uh, through engagement with uh, other competition agencies around the world about how we think antitrust law should and should not be applied to try to counteract that, that tendency that, uh, that has emerged. Uh, the other thing is that sometimes, uh, and this is related, sometimes our own competition advocacy or our own statements in the U.S. are taken uh, out of context uh, uh, or uh, not, uh, not, not viewed as what they are uh, when they are uh, travel to foreign jurisdictions. So for example, um, we re have a relatively narrow mandate under our business review letter process to review a certain set of facts that are provided to us at a certain time and decide whether or not uh, we're going to challenge that scheme of conduct at that moment in time. And that's what a business review letter is. And uh, that doesn't mean that there can't be instances where after a business review letter issues that, that uh, for example, the entities uh, change their conduct or modify what they're doing or anti-competitive effects emerge that, uh, that couldn't warrant uh, further inquiry. Um, that's not to mean that business review letters, uh, you know, are, you know, sh should not uh, uh, give businesses some sense of where the division is going. Uh, in its enforcement priorities, but at the same time, we think sometimes they're taken too far to be a uh, policy position that is going to be set in stone and continue uh, in all instances going forward. So we need to try to help explain that to uh, to uh, agencies abroad. Yeah. Respond just a couple things, and <clears throat> um, I did just want to uh, just talk about Tad's point, sorry, this is a little off the patent thing, but just about this question about what was meant by rebalancing economics and the um, when uh, then Assistant Attorney General Christine Burney revoked the Section 2 standards. I mean, I, I mean, 
that's what she said. I don't think she meant that economics is not going to play a role. And I think what we see the Obama administration do, the economics did play a big role. So um, I, you know, I just I just quibble a little bit with that. This is problematic that that she said that. And I I would love to hear any feedback on what those cases were that were lacking a sound economic basis. Um, I think it was a lot. I think what the last administration do was to you know think think novelly about what we're, what the problems we're seeing and use economics to analyze those problems and to provide the data and show the competitive effects to make a case. So I just wanted to um, mention that quickly. And then on the foreign side, I mean, I think, I think you're right. I think the agencies need to be really careful about what they say. Um, and I think that goes you know, across um, many different areas, not just patents. Um, but you know, I do think we need also need to be mindful that we shouldn't not speak or not enforce because we're worried about foreign agencies misinterpreting what we're saying. I think that would be a real loss to say, well, we really shouldn't do anything here because we're worried that foreign agencies won't um, will misinterpret that and and do um, nefarious things in their own enforcement, which is why I think Macon's efforts, as Andrew mentioned, are so important. Like that is what the whole competition advocacy on the foreign um, on the for in the foreign field is all about is to make sure our messages are heard, to make sure they translate the right way into another economy. Um, I think that there have been certainly efforts to do that in the patent space, in the IP space, where you've seen some other jurisdictions, um, uh, you know, mandating certain licensing, and that is not something that is a good thing. That is a real problem. I think um, we've been limited in our in the conversation about how standard essential patents. Um, and that are developed as part of the standard setting process and those that have FRAND commitments to them are something different. And that is when, um, when I think there is a role for antitrust because it creates such um, a market power. And you certainly, certainly there are other statutory ways to address those problems, but I also think the antitrust agencies should just say, well, there are other ways to deal with that. We shouldn't, we don't need to get involved. I mean can bring private antitrust suits. That doesn't mean the Department of Justice and, the F F Justice and FTC don't get involved and they see competitive problems. So I think the problem and the issue of hold up, and I guess that's maybe something we, maybe I'm just kind of curious. I mean, do you think there is a, is a problem of hold up? Do you think that's a real problem? Um, and if so, how do you deal with that? Is there anything different about a patent case involving standard essential patents or, or not? Well, let me, let's, let's get into something that I think Going and, and, and Andrew mentioned too that he thought there was a, a role for the standard setting organizations to be uh, to be proactive on on this. Um, but you know, there, there seems to be this is another point uh, Maureen made in her paper that you know that the way this the, the way this whole system is set up seems guaranteed to produce a lot of litigation. You do it's in a sense what, what, what's the easy stuff which has come up with the, the standard the technical specifications of the standard up front okay and then you make a, a vague promise to uh, license it on reasonable terms uh, that's obviously open to interpretation uh, and you put that off till later and, um, and that, that system is almost guaranteed to, to lead to lots of arguments um, is there any way around that, or is that uh, kind of the best that can be done? So I think the efforts by the standard setting organizations themselves to um, to have some rules and to have some processes is actually a really good thing. That means antitrust agencies don't need to get involved if they can um, come up with their own ways to address the potential for um, patent holdup. Anybody else on that? I, I mean, it, it really gets to the question of is the standard setting process working well or is it not working well? Does anybody have any? I, mean, I don't know. Has anyone know. quantified how many problems? I mean, we hear about the big problems, right? right? We hear about the ITC cases. We hear about um, the big problems. So I don't know. I would be curious. Like, well, You want to go first? Well, if you're going, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> but I insist you go first. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to agree with the, with the general sentiment. I mean, when, when you get into a standard setting uh, context and where there are standard essential patents owned by multiple parties, 
you're clearly, you know, you're not, you're not in Kansas anymore. You know, we're not talking about uh, the uh, um, 20 iron scrap dealers in the Cleveland area. Th these are extremely complicated situations. They're, uh, they're systems that require collaboration between a number of independent parties. And you're in an area, maybe, maybe it would be helpful to draw a, it, it's, it, it's not the greatest analogy, but kind of like a credit card system. You know, uh, to put together, I mean, credit card systems are incredibly useful. They have transformed uh, the world of uh, how transactions are done in consumer finance. But it, it has required, you know, decades to build up these systems. Uh, and uh, the cooperation of uh, the merchant banks, the banks that sign up, uh, you know, the, the flower shops and the 7-Elevens and what have you, so that they can accept credit cards, the uh, the card issuing banks, uh, the, the 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 entity that has put together the system itself, the software and the communications gear and the security protocols and and all th these are incredibly huge, uh, complicated systems, and uh, early attempts to apply antitrust, for example, just by saying well. The setting of an interchange fee, the the amount that a merchant bank, uh, that, that 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 a card issuing bank uh, uh, charges the merchant for uh, for processing the paper generated by the transaction, well, setting that rate, uh, well, that's just price fixing. Well, there was there were years of very uh, of really of careful and really brilliant scholarship that went into explaining why you couldn't under the antitrust laws analyze the setting of an interchange fee as if it was price fixing. Uh, and this is, I think, a somewhat similar context. Because, because uh, the collaboration of independent parties, parties that own different pieces of intellectual property, each of which is entitled to you know, kind of seek their own return, because the products themselves are so complicated and the standards require tremendous uh, collective effort to develop, what you really need is, is very careful and uh, and discriminating analysis so that you can tell the difference between uh, things that look anti-competitive and things that are really essential to make uh, to make the system work. And I, I, I think I heard uh, uh, Andrew say, and if he, if he did, I, I enthusiastically approve, that there are all kinds of devices available to the, uh, to the SDOs and their members and the participants and so forth uh, and, and other systems of law to get this to work out right. And, and uh, what I was trying to convey is that I think that the, the antitrust flurry involved a number of agencies uh, kind of pouncing in uh, with particular prescriptions before that private ordering, you know, the, the, the working out of the, of the various complex relationships in light of the other constraints of the process, but before it really had a chance to evolve and work itself out. And that's why, why my primary policy prescription would be to, to try to back off, not develop special antitrust rules, and try to do a better job of letting those private systems uh, work out and see if they can, they can make progress. So we'll, we will never be in a place where the antitrust system can intervene in standard setting, I mean, except in the most egregious cases of misconduct. Where, where antitrust can say, uh, can look at a, a tremendously complex system like a, like a standards development organization, the IEEE or Etsy or whatever, and a system of standards for mobile telecommunications and say, say ah, here is, the, here is the precise little piece of conduct that went wrong and we're going to stop it and, and then we can go away and everything, everything will be wonderful uh, you know, from, here, from here forward. Uh, oh, as a matter of fact, to illustrate this idea, uh, let me say that I am the, the mid-Atlantic distributor for uh, Ann Bingaman and her success in the first Microsoft case. Now, the Microsoft, most people know the Microsoft Section 2 litigation that was this massive effort that lasted a decade and, uh, and ended up with this uh, divestiture proposal, which was rejected by the D.C. Circuit and went back, and it was settled on different terms in the first uh, uh, Bush 43 uh, administration, and there's a lot of debate about whether it really did any good or not, and that was a very 
a very complicated, multifaceted matter. Uh, by contrast, way back in the early 90s, Ann Bingaman, who, who was um, uh, Carter's first assistant attorney general, uh, saw this, the so-called per program license, a, a provision that I think required a PC manufacturer to, to pay Microsoft as if uh, all of its PCs carried the Windows operating system, even if they didn't. And what I love about that case is from the moment that Ann got that in, in, in the Department of Justice, it was a case actually transferred from the Federal Trade Commission, but from the moment it came into the Department of Justice to the moment that the decree settling that case was entered, I think was just about precisely one calendar year. Now, if you have an antitrust case where you can challenge one isolated practice and bring the case to conclusion in one year, it almost doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong because your intervention is so limited and the costs of, de of debating the anti-competitive effects of the particular practice are so, so small and the, and the industry is moving so fast, at least you don't get in the way of a bunch of other stuff. But when you, when you bring these uh, huge, complicated uh, schemes you know, to force the sharing of intellectual property or to enforce mandatory access to, a, to an essential facility or to try to regulate the rate, the royalty rates at which these important technologies are licensed uh, as between the various players. Now you're asking for an enormous, complicated, quasi-regulatory antitrust intervention and history has shown that those are almost always guaranteed not only to fail but to produce uh, results that go the wrong way. So, it's very interesting. Yeah. You, I'd like to open it up for a couple of questions. Did, did you want to say something, Andrew? I was just going to add one thing quickly, which two thoughts occurred to me actually when when Tad was talking. One of them is the analogy to interchange is very interesting, uh, and there's another one which is the analogy to uh, the way performing rights organizations operate in the U.S. and they're they're obviously a very different sort of regime. They operate, and this is BMI and ASCAP operate under consent decrees, but they have a, something that's similar in structure to a standard setting organization in this sense. They're solving the problem of uh, innovators like songwriters and commercializers who are the music publishers trying to come together and create a, you know, a product that is in some way that is different as the Supreme Court has held different from what any one of them individually could, could uh, could create by licensing music individually, and it, it facilitates the commercialization of their their products. And antitrust law has tried uh, to uh, impose some rules on the way that operates, and there's currently some litigation about that from which I'm recused because I was involved in that litigation before I returned to the Justice Department. But in many ways, it it's sort of captures that same idea that it takes a lot of very careful thought uh, and about how to apply the antitrust laws in a way that facilitate uh, competition, promote innovation, uh, promote commercialization, and at the same time don't inadvertently try to do, do some harm. Um, with respect to business review letters, I think in some ways that comes out because business review letters can't be a tool to micromanage the way standard setting organizations operate. They can say things like, uh, this standard setting organization has proposed to adopt this certain set of rules. If the Justice Department issues a letter and says, these rules today don't seem like a competitive problem, that doesn't mean and isn't a prescription going forward that every standard setting organization has to adopt these rules, or that this is the right way to do it, or that this is the only way to do it, or the best way to do it. And, uh, and standard setting organizations, even when they do adopt those rules, should continue to think about whether or not those rules are working after the business review letter issues. So, uh, Steve, yeah. And also, if you could uh, identify yourself and your affiliation, if any. Uh, Steve Merrill, Duke Law School. Um, instead of asking the global question, is the standard setting process working well, I'd like to ask what your perceptions of this evolution of private ordering has been in the last few years. Um, have standard setting organizations clarified their policies and practices with regard to FRAND or disclosure or use of injunctions and exclusion orders? Has anybody followed the IEEE? Um, or has, 
are pretty are circumstances pretty much the same as they have been before. Yeah, so I don't work in standard setting organizations, so I don't have a direct look into that, but through litigation, uh, we have seen some changes. So, of course, disclosure rules are much clearer. Uh, the, now it's clear that once you transfer the patent, the friend commitment will, bite also, will be binding also for the new owner. But when it comes to friend commitments and any clarification about that, no, the documents have been the same. There has been nothing really added. The IEEE is really an exception and hasn't the, f the example hasn't been followed by the other SSOs. I have seen in litigation more and more creative arguments of what the friend commitment imposes, what obligations arise from the friend commitment. But there is, I have found very little support in any of the documents of the SSOs for this proposed interpretations. So no, there has been very little um, change. Uh, there was a program put on by the American Bar Association section of antitrust law, I think it was October 19th, uh, and uh, it was, uh, it should be, some version of it I think should be available on the, uh, on the ABA website, but, but it's interesting, there, there, there was a, an IEEE, uh, I want to say, I, I'm going to say representative, but that's not quite right. He operates his own firm, but he is the, I think, the leader of the IEEE group that is responsible for the evolution and management of the standard for Wi-Fi. And he participated in that panel along with uh, uh, some other industry representatives from Qualcomm, for example. And uh, there, there is this emerging literature on what the influence of the recent legal developments has been. And uh, the IEEE, of course, makes the case that it's all fine, but there is, a, there, the, there is a strong case to be made on the opposite side that it has noticeably increased the reluctance of parties uh, to participate or to give FRAN commitments uh, in, in that standard setting body. So, so it's, uh, it's something that is being looked at actively. And other questions, comment? Yeah. Um, I know that you all might not, oh, excuse me, Arita Solon, Ostrapi, I know that you all might not be the right people to ask this, but I wanted to ask in terms of a startup or an early stage company. Let's just presume you have an early stage company. It's mostly IP driven. It's going to, uh, it's been acknowledged by the industry that it's got a technology that can change something core about that industry. Would would a st an early stage company want to s create its own standard? I mean, would it be wrong for them to create their own standard setting organization, or would um, would would it be good for them to start thinking about some of these antitrust matters ahead of time because that's sort of the rocky path they might have to go down? I mean, what would be some of the advice you'd give to an early stage company that might be facing some of these issues later on down the road to sort of be a little bit ahead of the curve? Does that make any sense? I'm not an advice so. giving business. <laughs> well, I mean, well, you know, uh, neither am I. There are <laughs> there, there are examples of individual companies that have created their own standards. You know, Microsoft with Windows and things like that. So it doesn't standards don't have to be created. But you know, there's obviously if you're in a if you're in an industry where there's lots of lots of different players, you may need to have a, the cooperation of the rest of the players. Maybe it also depends on how many, how broad, how broad a number of patents you need for the standard, um, and what that, what that picture looks like. I mean, do you remember it was uh, Blu-ray and what's the one that lost? <laughs> um, Blu-ray lost. DVD. Blu-ray Blu and HD, HD DVDs. Yeah. I mean, those were those. That was you know that was true um, uh, standard setting by competition, right? The market decided. Yeah, it's, it's a really important question because uh, ideally what, what you would like to see, if it's possible, is different standards emerging. Now, there, there, there are problems with that. And these, these uh, split uh, standard, you know, the, the, the DVD, Blu-ray 
split is an illustration, and you're probably not old enough to remember the difference between, what was it, VHS Beta. and Betamax when, <laughs> when, okay. But, but ideally, you want competition to determine the winner where there are these so-called, so I guess they call them the format wars. But um, I can think of, a, uh, of an aerospace startup uh, that had a, a, a really spectacular idea for, uh, and, and a, a product for getting satellites, get, getting things into orbit. And it was definitely a very big competitor of uh, some of the gigantic uh, defense contractors who already had the business of getting things into orbit. And I won't name any names, but let's say that uh, when they tried to promote their product as a unique uh, standalone solution, uh, the, they, were, they were told by some obviously very well-advised uh, people at the defense contractors, well, you, could, you should feel free to go ahead and do that, but just we want to let you know we will stop doing favors for you, which is uh, a, a kind of a, a dilemma that I think any breakthrough technology inventor is going to have. He's probably going to get enormous benefits from getting the club to accept his technology. Uh, uh, but uh, but maybe uh, the promise of even greater benefit by going it alone and not being beholden to anyone is a great temptation. But there's some huge trade-offs there. But from the antitrust perspective, fundamentally, if you're a startup with an idea that can shake the world and you don't really need everybody who's who's uh, bogged down in the standard-setting debates, uh, by all means, that's that's new entry. That's that's exactly what what uh, competition is all about. Yeah, I mean, one question is is, is how much how much competition is there between SSOs? Um, you know, do you? Uh, I mean, obviously, that doesn't help you for a, a standard that's already been where the commitments have already been made. But you know, if let's, if the innovators are unhappy with the IEEE policy, how easy is it for them to move? At least the next time they're going to participate in the standard my, my little last comment would be as you get more companies that are going to be the product is the IP you know where where other companies are going to be building off of that some of the stuff you talk about becomes a very important challenge for an early stage company I think to think about mm -hmm. well, we have time for one more question if there is one yes, sir. <laughs> Paula Viganiganti from Global Competition Review. Um, so I think there's like clear precedent for how um, under contract law, someone who's a third party beneficiary to the standard setting organizations deal with um, the patent holder works. I'm less clear about how it would work for bringing a cause of action for, for fraud. So say for example, in the situation of Rambus, if instead of the FTC getting involved and then eventually getting overturned, um, someone had tried to bring a fraud claim, like what would sort of be their standing to do so and so forth? Well, you could think about it a couple of ways. One of them is, are they did they do something or change their position materially in reliance on whatever the representations were? And maybe the standard setting organization is the sort of a plaintiff in that. I don't I don't know, but if there's a third party, somebody else that's harmed, there would, might be a way for them to have sort of a third party beneficiary standing in in some courts. But I don't know if that's you know or a contract based claim that would that would give rise to a similar sort of remedy. Um, probably not if there's just a if it's just you're thinking about a fraud remedy, but if you've got a contract and a fraud remedy, it might be both could function together. Okay, I'd like to thank the panel. I think it was a great discussion. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much.